body of Christ, and it's a particularly good to be together as we start going down the path of Lent. We begin our Lent uh, considerations, thoughts, reflections with Ash Wednesday, and I'm, I'm always kind of uh, uh, good with that. Uh, Ash Wednesday has a particular meaning for all of us, and it's good to be together as we start. Those of you joining us on the live stream, we're glad you're here with us as well. Our scripture this evening our sermon this, this evening is based on the scripture, uh, Gospel of St. Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 1 to 9. If someone here can jump on the live stream and post that so uh, uh, other folks can uh, uh, know where we're at. The irony, the irony of the disciples worrying about who is the greatest as we celebrate Ash Wednesday in the beginning of Lent is pretty fit, don't you think? I mean, we're all thinking about how we come from dust, and to dust we shall return. And the disciples are arguing about who is the best one of them all. They're playing the Muhammad Ali game, wondering who is the greatest. It seems a little ironic, or a lot ironic, but it's a pretty good setup for where Jesus goes next with this. And I'm always kind of fascinated by this reading because speaking of irony, in my younger days when I was angry with the church and uh, was, was a, 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 an opponent of the church, this was one of the texts that I used to be an opponent of the church and the, the hypocrisy and all the, the things. Because I grew up in a generation where you learned the Bible says X and that means X. Or the Bible says Y and that means Y. And there was no debate. Although 40,000 Protestant denominations would suggest that perhaps there was a little debate. And the interpretation was based more on what that particular church and what that particular pastor desired rather than a legitimately drawn conclusion of the interpretation of that text. And so I called into question the idea of cutting off our hands and our feet and plucking out our eyes as a response to how we should live rather than sin. Better to lose those appending hands, feet, and eyes than to take a 4,000 mile elevator ride down to the center of the earth and the molten fires of hell. Right? Isn't that what this is saying? And now I'm a pastor. <laughs> the irony is just too much someday. It may not be literal, but it's most certainly true. In the years since my anger at the church has mostly cooled, most, most days, I've learned a few things about Bible interpretation. And as you know, I'm not a literalist. Literal Bible readings, always literal Bible readings are problematic. But what about the truth of those readings if they're not literally precise? Well, here's the, here's the problem, and this just came up this week, and I am still having quite a lot of fun with it. Um, what I have before you is a, Roxy enjoys it's Glenn Rosenthal dropped his pack of material off on Sunday, and I'm still just not. This is a prayer handkerchief. What is a prayer handkerchief? Well, for that we have to go to Acts 19, verses 11 and 12, that refer to Paul using a handkerchief or an apron to touch people and heal them. And so this whole uh, ministry, based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, St. Matthew's Churches, uh, sent this entire pack, encouraged me to send the prayer handkerchief back with my prayer request, along with the address and prayer concerns for somebody else, along with my check. <laughs> uh, there's also a sealed prophecy in here that I can't open uh, because it's a sacred spiritual prophecy, sealed word, uh, concerning my future. <laughs> Unfortunately, I opened it. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. So far, so good. I mentioned this, uh, A, because it's funny. B, though, it has some serious implications. My, my daughter that used to live in Tulsa, I was sharing with her this with the kids, my kids as, as well, of course, because, well, no, it's funny. Um, and, but she went to look at, for that St. Matthew's Church in Tulsa, because all that's in there is a P.O. box. Um, and she went to go looking for that. When she came up, she screenshotted a Google search result of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church, who states very boldly, we're not that St. Matthew's Church that asks for money. This <laughs> stuff is causing real life problems for other people. So taking these very wrong interpretations of, of a literal kind of thing out of act to make a prayer handkerchief and send it to people asking for money is causing problems for churches that are trying to do the gospel. 
And so this is, uh, I, I could not have scripted this. The sermon was already well in hand. And, and the Bible study on, on Daniel 5 this morning was just a ride with, with that as well. And beer study and Bible tasting a week from Sunday, guess what's coming? You can read the whole thing there. <laughs> what it comes down to uh, is this. We must set aside our preconceived notions, which are frequently very culturally biased in ridiculous ways, and do the hard work of studying what's really going on, and not taking a handkerchief comment and making a minister. <laughs> We do this hard work so that we can understand what the storyteller, and Jesus in this case, was trying to impart to his listeners. In other words, so that we can understand the truth of God's word. Here Jesus is contrasting the manly man notion of Roman power in the Jewish world against what it means to be a child. The one idea of manly man stuff hasn't changed so much in 2,000 years, but what it means to be a child has changed greatly, and so it makes it difficult for us to understand the impact of what Jesus is saying. A child in Jesus' day was loved, was cared for, but it had much more of an economic impact than what we see uh, kids today have. And by that I mean that even as recently as my grandfather's day, he was the youngest of 13 uh, siblings and half siblings, spanning birth years from 1869 to his uh, younger brother was born in 1905. They were economic impacts on an agricultural world. That's why my great-grandfather had 13 kids, because we were farmers, and that was free labor. Things have changed just in a short, that, that short period of time. 100 years later, things are very different. We view kids very differently. Like, again, they were loved, they were cared for, but it wasn't, they weren't the center of anybody's work. And today, well, no, sir. <laughs> Comparing the greatest with being that character of manly man Roman power versus a child with no power and no status was Jesus making a very serious point. And that is being a follower of Christ goes without power. And the idea of being the greatest makes no sense in the context of being a follower of Christ. It meant that we have no more real power than a child. And a child usually uses it wiser than we do. Our riches and our position mean very little in the face of following Christ. What it means is our position and power can easily become a millstone, a great big rock wrapped around our neck as we are cast into the depths of the sea. Particularly when we use that position and that power to further our own ends at the expense of someone else. What it means is we are dust, and to dust we shall return. It is indeed ironic, but very on point, that no matter what it is we do in this life to be rich, to be powerful, we're all going to end up in the same place. We're going to end up as dust. So what do we do between now and then? Jesus would suggest, quite directly, not trying to be powerful to start with, and also being active about our faith. That's what that business is with the maiming and blinding and all that. Jesus wants us to be active participants in our faith. Your sins are forgiven without requirement and without strings attached. Faith, on the other hand, is something that is practiced. Both are gifts. But when they're left on the shelf... What happens to them? They collect dust. They collect dust. And they serve no other purpose than something other than something to look at and perhaps lift up as an article of pride. Oh, look at how faithful. Neither of which accomplishes much. This is certainly not what Jesus calls, calls us to. Jesus asked us to exercise our faith. Jesus asked us to practice our faith. Jesus asked us to make our faith an active part of our life, not a passive statue sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Well, that's a good time to reflect on it and give some thought and, and prayer to our faith practices. With busy schedules and full calendars, it's really easy to let faith slide by the wayside. 
there are any number of pressures that come down on us and nothing changes or improves if we don't do something about it. What can we do to exercise our faith? There's lots of options. Lots of things that come to mind on Ash Wednesday. But I would, I would put two, uh, two ideas out there. Uh, first and foremost, our faith, our, our faith practices, our spiritual disciplines sometimes are known as, are an active doing kind of thing. We can't practice being joy. Joy is something that we have, perhaps, but it's not something we do. So a, a faith practice is something that we can, in fact, practice. The second thing, I think, is it needs to be biblically based if it's going to be a faith practice. Now, there's a lot of denial that goes on during Lent. And there's, there's places in the Bible that talk about denying ourselves for this, that, and the other thing. But it's not particularly scriptural to deny yourself Facebook. It's not particularly scriptural, scriptural to deny yourself soda. Both are very good ideas. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with doing them, but it, it's, that, it's not exactly a faith practice to go off Facebook for six weeks. Faith practice. What are faith practices? Well, I would list prayer as number one. Get yourself a calendar, get yourself an app, get yourself something to remind you, set an alarm to pray faithfully every day. And do it every day. It's really easy to let that slide by. I missed my appointment today, the alarm went off, and I was on my way to Ace Harbor. I caught up to it when I got back to the office. But the point is, though, it's really easy to, even on Ash Wednesday, I missed my 2 o'clock appointment. Prayer is number one. Number two, I don't know, I would call it Bible reading and study. That's part of that hard work of understanding what is being said. And not falling for your prayer hand because some guy that seems to know scripture said so. We gotta do the hard work of what the things mean. We gotta do the study, we gotta do the reading, it doesn't happen. We leave ourselves vulnerable to anybody's misinterpretation if we don't do the hard work of some study. Devotional reading, closely related to number two, see above. Devotional reading tends to have more of a direction to it, with somebody having often commentary on the, on the reading. And, and we're providing one. The Synod has written a devotional reading for the, the, the Lenten season. It's going out on Facebook. You may have seen it this morning if you follow the, the Spirit of Hope page. Uh, Lori's loading those in. And uh, we've also... Uh, Send out the link if you want to download your own copy of it. We've got a couple of hard copies on the counter in the Commons, and if you don't have internet access, you should have gotten a, a copy of, uh, we tried to mail that to folks that didn't have it, so we can all do that. Devotional reading, uh, really as a Nebraska Synod, together every day, so that's, that's kind of cool. So that's, that's out there. Number four, worship. Well, you're here, so way to go. Uh, you got a good start on that. Worship matters. And all of us are a little short on worship this past month. It's been, it's been tough. The weather has not been uh, kind to any of us as we try to worship. And it's easy to get out of the habit of worship when we get interrupted. That worship is a critical piece. And plus we come, it's not on my list, but it's on many lists, confession is a spiritual discipline. Well, we're Lutheran, so we have confession every time we come to worship. We have confession a little bit, so you got that's like a two. For, you get two for one on that. <laughs> Service, don't miss out on opportunities to serve the community. We're going to have a whole bunch of people over in Matt Talbot Kitchen and Outreach the uh, day after next. So those kind of things, be aware of those and participate in them when they come up. Generosity, uh, number six. Our giving can be sporadic at times uh, and closely related to when we're physically present in church. Uh, give some thoughts about making an intentional act of exercising our faith each week by our, the way we do our giving. And, and now that I've given you a long list of things to think about and participate in, and I'm not saying do all of them, pick one and do it every day in the next six weeks. Uh, number seven, Sabbath. Don't forget, in the midst of full calendars and busy schedules, to take some time for Sabbath. Because exhaustion will get in the way of your faith. Just like it gets in the way of everything else, really. Can you tell me one thing that improves with exhaustion? Rest. Hmm? Rest. 
Yeah, well, it, that makes it better, <laughs> but it doesn't, I can't do anything better if I'm exhausted. Sabbath is the only thing that changes that, and it's a good discipline to get into. Our faith practices matter, and Lent is a good time to reconnect with some of them. Uh, if you want to know some Bible apps, get a hold of me, and I'll, I'll, I'll point you down in the right direction. Uh, different places to sign up and this, that, and the other thing. There's, there's ways to do that if you just will. Now, I want to ask our hospitality folks, there's a couple baskets of nails. Uh, as a way of remembering our spiritual disciplines, our faith practices, um, we have some nails that we want to hand out. I want you to carry those nails through the season of Lent and then bring them back on Good Friday. But use that nail as a reminder of Christ going to the cross, certainly, that's the symbolism, that's not a surprise. But use it as a reminder for whatever your faith practice, whatever your spiritual discipline is that you're using for the next 40 days of Lent, in the next six, seven weeks or so. And uh, uh, keep that with you, just as that, that Lent reminder. We'll continue passing those out, getting them all handed out. Uh, if you don't uh, uh, get one on the first pass, we'll, we'll, we'll have them around and we'll get those, get those to you. And like I said, bring those back on Good Friday uh, so that uh, we've got plans for them then. We have plans for them then. Those of you joining us Facebook Live, thank you so much. It was great to have you here this evening, and we appreciate everybody's attention to that. If you uh, are here Sunday, we'll have mails out on the counter uh, for everybody as well.